Welcome to the College of Complexes. We were late getting here tonight due to traffic. Well, you said the opposite of what I'm saying, right? You just said we were approaching a quiet period with the solar accident. Right. That's wrong. You, you, just agree, you disagree with that, no, right? You, that's yeah. wrong. It's not that he disagrees. We have a disagreement. Um, okay. He's going to pick. Yes, the girls. Well, Will, you kept giving figures of gallons of oil <coughs> that can, barrels that can be retracted. Extracted. Extracted. The oil industry itself doesn't value oil that can be extracted. The only thing they ever talk about is oil at the pump. Oil things like shale have been known since the 30s. And they don't calculate it into reserves. No, they do not. The only thing they calculate is oil at the pipe, and I was in the town that flows through the pipe, and that's how they base the price is based on oil that flows, oh, yeah, we're talking about price. not no, we're, we're talking about recoverable. hypothetical we're talking about, oil. We're talking about recoverable oil. No, okay. yeah, what in the world does that mean? I'm telling you, the oil industry, let me pose the what? question. Doesn't bother with that because it's all hypothetical nonsense. They know and the, no, it's the price that I think it's Shilling, Oklahoma, where it's oil in the oil. That is, the, the other stuff is hypothetical oil. No one calculates that. The oil industry does not. I assure you, they, they, they do not. They know it's there. They know it's recovered. Okay. No, they, they do. No oil. They do. And they know that they're being prevented from recovery. But they know what's there, they know what's recovered. The only thing that determines the price of oil is stuff that's in a barrel. I agree with you on that. What's the price of oil? Once, once, this, once it's all recovered, it will bring the price of the barrel down. That's the whole point. That's going to bring the price down. Oh, no Shale, oil is going to bring the price down. No, I'd jobs. like to see it's the article you got on that. Russell Jobs. It's a flag oil. That's nonsense. If the flag oil has been going up every year because of a lack of oil, that's why the price of oil has been going up every year because of a new discovery, the new technologies are getting out of the ground. That makes it cheaper? Yeah. If the flag goes up, it's going to be changing. The price well at five bucks, that's why it doesn't make it cheaper. It's a plan to make it It makes it economical to do so. It doesn't make it cheap. Well, no, but there's always well, making it Charles. Well, no, what you keep ordering Charles? No, no, he said. All right, well, no. So what you're saying is that there is no oil or no pollution problem with oil, correct? No. I mean, there's always a possibility of pollution problem, but I think that you know, with the new technologies that's out there now, I think it's very minimal now. Price more so than the See, we, we, you know, when we look at those back in the 30s and 40s and all gas was rushing out of the all right. So if I so if I'm to quote you then you believe there is no global warming problem, correct? No no man made global warming problem. Okay, as a the world has been warming and cooling ever since the Earth came into existence. It's been warming and cooling. The whole issue is that man made is that. My position is that man made is a natural cycle that the Earth grows with. Okay, what are your views on thorium? Bill has the extra question. You said that, that because carbon dioxide is necessary for life, but that shows that carbon dioxide cannot be a problem. Thank you. Water is also necessary for life. Does that mean there's no such thing as drowning? <laughs> 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 I mean, that's, 
Something connected with what you're talking about. I'm applying your logic. No, that's not, that's not logical at all. That's right. Yeah, so you, that's right, you, exactly. You, 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 you don't have to. Exactly, that. that's so not logical at all. That's what they are trying to prove. You have a choice for the reason I'm talking about. I'm talking about breathing. I'm talking about climate change. You said that because carbon dioxide is essential to life, too much carbon dioxide cannot be a problem. I said, does that mean that because water is essential to life, by the same logic, there's no such thing as drowning? You have to get in water, you can't swim to drink. You have no choice but to breathe out carbon dioxide. There's no such carbon dioxide. There's no choice with carbon dioxide. You said there can't be such a thing as too much. We've had much more carbon dioxide. We've had much more carbon dioxide in the air than we have now. Who this says so? No, 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 no. Not hand waving. Name a name. Name a name a title of a publication. Okay, I'll Who says so? I'll give you something. Then. No, here and now. I'll give you something in a minute. That's bullshit. Oh, 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 I got all these references, everybody talk to you. Well, we have a second question from Peter. So what's the end of this question? Well, yeah, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's just a, the university is getting a huge amount of money from doing Not research. Not A huge amount of money to do research for the government. So, you get politicians that are leaving, University professors and scientists on the university level, they're going to say, okay, yeah, I believe in an office if I get this huge grant. You know, to read the question about it. So you follow the money, you can, you can, you can see anything you're talking about. What was the name of the author of the book that you actually remember the title? Uh, you see, I, don't, I can't see the author, but I don't remember. Give me a moment, I'll look at it. Don't remember that name, don't remember from um, you mentioned the importance for us having energy independence. Does that also include wind, solar, and um, high-speed railroad? See, you can put it in the middle. See, my whole, my whole problem is this: if, if you have, if you have, you have corporations that want to build a railroad. Without us having to put our tax money in, it's fine. If they can make a profit, I think they should. But I would think that we should have to subsidize something that, that, that really is not paid, that don't pay for itself. So to that, Amtrak, Amtrak has always been at a loss ever since it's been in existence, as a matter of fact. Just to follow up. Uh, tell me what you think about the alternative called thorium nuclear power. Alternative nuclear power? Thorium, thorium nuclear power. Specifically the liquid fluoride thorium reactor. I'm sorry, what was the question then? The liquid fluoride thorium reactor. Okay. That has to do with nuclear power, you said? Yes, it does. I have no problem with nuclear power. Point of information? Yes, sir. The entire United States railroad industry was built on gargantuan federal giveaways. It was based on government grants. No. That's the point of this. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've never heard of that. Well, it's called history. Try it well, sometime. Well, I think it's called no. 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 As far back as 1980, there were eight universities, and I don't remember the particulars, and they opened it up to see if their facts were, were indications of global warming taking place. And each of the universities operating independently came back to the conference. Now your premise is, is that there's been a great conspiracy for the academic geologists, climatologists. They're all been corrupted by government money. And the other premise was that the entire legislative assembly is lazy. And you're saying no. no. 
So you kill the messenger, and therefore there's no global warming. The entire academic community has been so loud, they're publishing only all that academic literature. Wait a minute. Let me finish my question. All that academic literature, since going back to 80, 30, 25 years of literature, is false and incorrect. No, no, all no. that journal literature, no, you got some that are in those academic college libraries, all of it is paid off trick. No, no, you got some of it that's correct. Some of it. Some of it that's correct. That's scary. You got some of it that's smart. You got some of it that they're, they're in it. You know what happens in academia if you publish stuff that alone you're not true? Do you know what happens to your career? Yeah, it, 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 you know, it, you know it, what happens it, in it, academia? If the people who publish it believe it, nothing happens to your career. What happens to your career? If you're if found out it, to publish people stuff. publish it, do not take your position, you can get kicked off. You can't get kicked off the top if you continue. But you can get, you can you can end up not your stuff accepted in the, in the academic publication. So you're it's, telling it's, it's me it's got to be very political. Is what I'm saying. It's got to be very political. So, so you're telling me if you're in a situation that you publish something that's false, you are confronted with expulsion. Your career is over, and you're saying they took money in order to do this. There's yeah, false stuff that's published all the time. They're tenured professors. Why are they doing that? Isn't that just because there's money in it? There's money in it. You're going to chance expulsion? They're not going to chance expulsion your because the rest, of, the rest of the faculty and the publisher of the publication believes the same thing. How are they going to get expulsion? Can you give one instance? If they believe it, then everything is, everything is cool. Everything well, what, what percentage of those right. articles are, are no. false? Uh, no. Uh, what? Not I have a question. You got a question. I don't want everybody else to But I The person giving that speech is a science teacher. <laughs> different speakers every week. Global warming and global freezing of the past. Matt Lowry has a master's degree. Um, It'll be science. What is it that it won't be Alex and Sons are pointing from it? That indicates that the uh, global warming uh, is attributable to doing that. Uh, what is it that they're pointing to? No, they're, 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 they're taking a position that, you know, the burning of fossil fuels is, is what contributed to the uh, increase of CO2 in the air. What are the indications that it is attributable to uh, the uh, oil and coal and other uh, human contributions? Uh, I, I think the false position, I don't think. What is their evidence? I, I can't conceive of that. I, I mean, I've looked at it and I can't, I can't see what they have. What is it what you look for? What is the evidence that they say that these things are? I don't think they have any. I don't think they have any. What do they what say they have? <laughs> what, what they're saying is that because, because we're, we're an industrialized nation, we are producing excess amount of CO2 in the air. The CO2 that gets into the air because of us being an industrialized nation, burning fossil fuel, is causing the, 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 the heat to the, not be escaped from the earth like it should and being and be captured and destroying warming up the earth. That's the position that they're taking. How does the mechanism work? Huh? How the mechanism work that you don't believe? How is the mechanism that trapped the mechanism. Oh, oh, oh. Why, why do I not believe it? Why do you not believe the mechanism that we have to work? Because CO2 doesn't have an effect on it. But what is the mechanism that you don't believe? If you don't believe, you must understand what the mechanism is. 
and no one to don't believe it. I mean, so you were in church and they are not believe it. It's totally because the point, the, point, the point is that you know, it's, not, it's escaping and it's not being held into the earth. And CO2 is not stopping it. I mean, just, you know, you can, you can see you can come up with a premise, but you can't prove it, then what's the point? It's not scientific. If you don't understand that, how can you prove it? Can't prove it. You know what a scientific method is? You know what a scientific method is? You don't know what a scientific method is. You don't. Know you, know method method is. You, you don't. Take a premise, are there you take a premise other and you have a scientific method. You don't understand it. God damn it. That's what it is. That's what it is. That's what a scientific method is. Oh, oh, okay. Question. Are you aware of the pronouncement that Dr. Sarah Lovinger, the executive director of the Physicians for Social Responsibility, has said that uh, climate change is the worst public health uh, issue in the nation? Can you refute that statement from Dr. Lovinger? Where does she base it on? <laughs> Where does she base it on? <laughs> well, let me say it this way. She bases it on the uh, fact, for example, that uh, malaria breeding mosquitoes are moving further northward because of climate change enables them to grow. She bases it on such things as the further currents of the West Nile, which those are two things. Another fact is as well. So uh, why don't you take into account the pronouncement of people in the medical field like Dr. Rutherford who see climate change is also a disruption of public health? The malaria, the malaria has been a fact in certain parts of the world for centuries. Are you aware that England is preparing for an outbreak of malaria which is expected to be induced? but it's not the question and answer. Um, turning, you make your hand up. Natural cycles of cooling and warming, I think this is very well established. Let's further take the take the research that's been done to show that carbon dioxide will be thick Ten, your iced tea is coming right out. global warming is not created by man, should we still try to prevent it or um, mitigate it or, or, uh, you know, it's, it's, um, I believe that, you know, we, we should understand that we have very little effect on, on, on changing the climate for human beings. Now, in terms of the you know, thing that's protective of the environment, certainly we should be concerned about. Look, when I was a kid, there 
Sweetheart, thank you. You're welcome, honey. In your presentation, you did not name one single number until you started quoting propaganda from the car industry. Do you have any numbers other than the oil and coal carbon industry propaganda? Thank you, Corey. In your presentation, what numbers do you want? What numbers do you want? What you talk about? What numbers do you want? Do you want? Anything. You, you talked about CO2 and you didn't say how much. You said warm is good, but you didn't talk about I didn't how much CO2 is fire. You talked about sunspots, including claiming sunspots that nobody used to exist. Um, you, you talked energy independence without any numbers on consumption, production, needs, growth, efficiency. The only numbers in the presentation were numbers that you got from the carbon industry propaganda. Yeah, Give us some other numbers, well, please. I just mentioned to you that the air, that you could make some 8% of our air. That's an element that makes some 8% of our air. Congratulations, you graduated 50%. Oh, that is not a... No, no, I graduated. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know what school you graduated. I went to graduate school. Did you go to grad school? Okay, we're just fine. Okay. So we don't want to get into that. We can talk about what school you went to. That ain't the issue. So that ain't the issue. We ain't going to talk about what school you went to. I don't use Marker either. Gene Marker has the next question. Uh, you, you mentioned uh, political figures, and most of the people in the room are probably, almost all of us are from Illinois, so we share two senators. I have not written to our senators or asked them about their position on global warming. You happen to know the position of our two senators on global warming. Uh, I, I would believe that um, since the German probably believe that global, believe in global man and global warming. No, no, I, no, I haven't looked at their website, but I, can say, I think each of us can go look at their website if we're interested in the topic. No, I haven't looked at their website. Thank you. No, sir, I'm not. Loud, Andy. Are, are you familiar with the work of uh, you, Are you familiar with the work of Avery Lovins and Rocky Mountain Institute? No. <laughs> well, so Rocky Mountain Institute is a Mayo Clinic of Energy and Women's. They've been doing studies on the solutions for global warming and solving the problems for the last 30 years or so. Are you familiar with the work of James Hansen from NASA? I've heard of James Hansen. Because they, they've been putting out all kinds of reports. Yeah, yeah. The, kind of yeah. the specific question I have for you is, have you seen any of the reports talking about what it's going to be like if the methane uh, in the permafrost of Russia and other places, the methane trapped in the ice, is 20 times more potent as a global warming gas and CO2. What's the planet going to be like if, if the methane warms up and melts? I mean, okay, well, the question is, uh, what's the likelihood of this melting? What's the likelihood of this melting? What is the 
exactly what it is. It's melting now. It's melting now. Yes. It's getting mushy now, and a lot of ice is melting in other places. We're talking about a sea level rise of 40 years. It's very tenuous. Yeah, okay. Here's the thing. Now, we talk about, uh, we just talk about glaciers, or I mean ice, birds is already in the sea melting. Is that what you're talking about? That this may cause that to melt? Well, we're talking about ice in Greenland, uh, stuff that's been frozen for millennia. Yeah, right. uh, you know, they're, they're talking about I mean, ice you got, you got, the North you got, yeah, you got ice chunks breaking off on a regular basis. And that, that's just an argument. Not right thing. now. Yeah, yeah, you do. Okay, you haven't seen any of the reports coming out this summer saying that the, the, the amount of ice up at the North Pole is the smallest amount. They've got the widest open water on record. I've seen that report. I've also seen the report that Antarctica is getting colder. And it's building up. I saw that report also. Not the main sources we're talking about. Yeah, well, it's in the Yeah, it's in the Yeah, that sounds like one of the talking points. No, it's, in, it's, in, it's in the literature. Antarctica is getting colder. Before you leave tonight, can you give us a list? I'm going to write this down. I'm going to write it off. I'm going to write it off now. All right. And by the way, pull a basket. About the best one in the Animal Kingdom. <laughs> okay. Assuming it is getting warmer, don't you think that the opening up of a Northwest Passage would benefit commercial shipping? <laughs> Yes. Well, yeah, well, about a year or so, right on Earth Day, a little over a year ago, an oil well started spewing out so many gallons per day. We got the entire southern coast of the United States. Are you actually advocating that each well is capable of? doing the same thing, I presume. And they're putting wells further and further out all over the ocean. You want, to, you want more of these along our coastline after what it did? I'm surprised that we didn't shut down every oil well on any coast after what happened. Do you think that was just the... They did shut them down and until, they, until they investigated and, and found out what the problem was. All of them was. forever. Do you realize the magnitude of that catastrophe? Yeah. But, but okay. you know, that's the that, that, that for months. Let me ask my question, damn it. It's pumping well for months and months. Why would you even allow them even a second or a third? And you want. And then the indefinite number of these are along our entire coast. There's all kinds of regulations that, you know, they're yeah. pertaining to build it all well to, to, to make the regulations were in place then. It was an accident. Yeah. Did you know it's more dangerous with those big ships bringing oil into so that's another the planet okay. from all the parts of the world getting the oil wells in, 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 in the Gulf? Producing oil. That's more dangerous. So that makes an oil well less dangerous. Yeah, it makes it less dangerous than the big, the big ship bringing oil from Oh, oil. I didn't know. So that hey, thing is going to go for it. Oh, what happened? What happened now? The last one was out there. The big ship. There's less than an oil thing. So. The tankers are more dangerous than oil. Yes. Three bottles. Can you tell us what your opinion of what happened, how large the disaster was in the Gulf of Mexico with British Petroleum? Do you, do you think that affected the oil industry or the fishery industry? Oh, yeah, no question about it. What's your, what's your opinion of should we continue drilling deep water? Yeah, or, I think or, or should we try to prevent those kind of disasters by finding uh, other alternatives to that, that oil? Well, no, I think that, um, I think, I think with the shutdown of those oil wells and the investigation that went on to determine what happened and the safety factors that, that were put into place, 
I think it even made it more safer to go after the law in the Gulf of Mexico. I think they learned from it. I think they learned the first part of my question. I think they learned from it. Answer the first part of my question. How big do you think the disaster was to the fisheries oh, that were out? Major, major, major disaster. I've been down in New Orleans since then. It was a major disaster. The question was how to do it. Which I'm gonna let you make up your own mind. I'm not gonna. I don't tell anybody how to vote. I don't tell anybody how to vote. I, 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 tell anybody, I think everybody. I think everybody should vote their own country. If we accept the notion that uh, the Gulf of Mexico is a
It doesn't sound like we've got an infinite supply of this. Now, if we have a finite supply of this, wouldn't it be intelligent that maybe this time we did something different? Because the end is near. But according to you, do we have an infinite supply of this? Until we have enough to go for the next 200 years. 200 years of oil? 200 years, right. 200 years. That the current rate of consumption? That, that, that's recoverable right now. <coughs> You mean in all these crazy processes? I'm going to give you all these things. We can get oil, I guess. Huh? Say it again. You know, using all these, these, these yeah. things aren't even in place. Okay. See, what are you talking about? Okay. We're talking about recoverable oil. That, that in existence that, that can be recovered and gotten out of the ground or out of the ocean. That's what I'm talking about right now. In Wyoming right now, they've, they've identified 1.4 trillion barrels of oil that can be covered. They identified rocks. In Colorado. They, 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 they identify rock or oil? Uh, rock or oil? Oil is, is in the shell. Kind of it's around in the rock. Right. Right. Can, can be recovered, yes. Right. And matter of fact, matter of fact, matter of fact, when they used to, when the covered wagons used to go into the west, they used to actually plant that oil in the rock and actually use it for the wheels in the covered wagons. I mean, oil was just that, the shell was just that available. One more question, Rom. Cubs or Sox fan? Cubs or Sox fan? Sox. I used to be a Cubs fan. Thanks for wasting our time. All right. Yes, I have a question for the chair. Um, is there a general, whatever rule, protocol, standard about people just making stuff up as they go along? No. You can't see it. No personal attacks or knowledge filters to speak. Podium up. Maybe go third. He's got a sense of the little chair. Uh -huh. Yes. Oh, you're the rest of the edge of the table. No, we had it this way. Oh, what? There you go, Charlie. Speaker Herman Cain for his presentation this morning. I know. In anticipation of your presentation this evening, I uh, made a written rebuttal which I'm going to read. Very short, very short. And it's entitled The Hoax of the Global Warming Deniers. 2012 had another normal global warming summer. The U.S. sweltered in the hottest July on record, following the hottest spring on record. More than 60% of the contiguous U.S. is suffering from drought, along with parts of Eastern Europe and India. Arctic sea ice cover is at a record low. The Greenland ice sheet shows extraordinary high melting, according to the U.S. National Snow and Ice Data Center. 
global land temperatures measured around the globe for May and June of 2012 were the highest since records were taken and began in the 19th century. Long time. El Nino conditions are forecast to warm tropical Pacific Ocean surface temperatures and send uh, and lead to record-breaking global temperatures in 2013. Now, now is a good time to sort the signal from the noise in the global temperature records. 30 years of global temperature, uh, global temperatures show a linear trend of 0.16 degrees centigrade per decade increase, there are two possible sources for this heat source. Uh, number one is the oceans are releasing heat. But measurements show just the opposite. The oceans are sucking up heat. Number two, heat is coming from above. Yes, but measurements, uh, uh, more radiation is entering the top of the atmosphere, but Greenhouse, glass, uh, greenhouse gas blankets, including methane and uh, carbon dioxide, which are sufficient quantities to affect this blanket, by the way, um, the blanket hinders the loss of heat into space. Superimposed on this global warming signal is short-term variability. Uh, some years are hotter, some are colder. For example, in 2005 and 2010, they were above the trend, they were warmer than the general trend. 2008 and 2011 were below the trend. But temperatures are creeping upwards within a corridor of plus or minus two tenths of a degree centigrade around, around the trend line. But temperatures are creeping up and the deniers use this variability to cherry pick time intervals that start with the upper part of the corridor and end with the lower part. They intentionally mix signal and noise. There are three known factors explain much of the natural variation. Volcanic eruption, Mount Pinatubo in 1991, followed, uh, was followed by three cold years. Solar variability, the 11 year sunspot cycle is one of them. The solar maximum uh, is going to occur in June of next year. We're, wrote, we're The sunspot number is increasing all the time. It will reach a maximum in June next year and then slowly decline into another 11 year minimum cycle. Uh, but solar activity has contributed nothing to the warming trend in the last 30 years. It has acted to reduce it. The hottest record hottest year on record 2010 was near the end of the deepest solar maximum uh, minimum rather since satellite measurements in 1970. Irregular oscillations between warm El Nino and cold La Nina in the Pacific Ocean uh, is the number is the third uh, factor here. 2011 was cool in the context of the previous 10 years. It really was the hottest El Nino on record, even though relatively it was a minimum. It's easy to remove signal from noise. Once this is done, and regardless of the global temperature data set that you use, the result is always a steady warming trend that has been no uh, has been not not slower in the past 10 years than it has in the previous 30 years. And this agrees with what was predicted by the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, unless a major volcano erupts, the 2013 El Nino, combined with the solar maximum in 2013, will increase global temperatures and probably set a global record. Now, the denial industry has come up with Plan B. They will blame global warming solely on El Nino. But El Nino warmth comes from the ocean. The ocean releases heat. During La Nina events, the ocean discharges that heat store into the cooler waters at the surface so they absorb more heat. So if global warming of the past decade was due to El Nino or another mechanism involving the heat from the ocean, the ocean would have lost heat. But the heat content of the ocean has gone up, not down. Why? 
we created a radiation imbalance by adding greenhouse gases to our atmosphere. The signal of global warming caused by humans is very clear despite attempts by certain parties to drown it out with a lot of noise. Uh, yeah, the speakers have a courage to be in front of us, uh, coming with such a lack of knowledge and lack of uh, interest in knowing the processes. Um, uh, he did not deny that global warming could be happening. What he denies is that it's uh, human, human created. Uh, for some unscrollable reason, he don't want to admit that human intervention could produce the global warming, observing and verified by scientific theory and empirical evidence. He somehow did not believe in, in the global warming by human induction, and he doesn't have any idea of the mechanisms of global warming. But worse yet, he doesn't have any curiosity to find out. The physical process was described and measured a hundred years ago by Sweden uh, scientists. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so the, the mechanism is well understood, is well defined, and is well measured by means uh, on this later year with the help of satellites that are observing the atmosphere, measuring the changes, etc., etc. Now, for the education of the group, we have to say that the process of global warming, uh, why the moon is not warm, uh, why it's so hot when the sun is shining and it's below zero when the sun is not, because they doesn't have the atmosphere to trap that heat. Uh, the process is not like somehow he tries to imply that he understood. What happened is that the Earth gets warm by the air, by the sun, and then the infrared photons uh, that try to escape back to the atmosphere, they are trapped and absorbed by the CO2 and other gases that they also uh, get, uh, get uh, interact with the uh, infrared photons and in that way they get heat up. The evidence that this process is going on is that the stratosphere is getting colder and the stratosphere getting colder because the, rise, the rays, the very high energy rays of the sun, they penetrate the atmosphere and when the infrared tries to go up it doesn't it, it couldn't, and so it doesn't heat up the stratosphere. So this is another uh, line of evidence that the balance of heat is being changed and is producing a, a measurable change in the temperature of the stratosphere. So um, I don't even know, and I, 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 I wonder how people that uh, have nothing or no axe to grind why they are taking a position that it doesn't have to benefit them. And this is uh, when we saw that, that film, What's Wrong with Kansas, where people all voting against their own interests. And so we are talking about saving our planet. And people take the position of, fuck it, you know, let it, let it be uh, destroyed, let it be turning to a, a hot oven and, and we, don't, we don't care. I don't know, what is the, the moral integrity, what is the empathy of these people who, who take this position where they don't care. So I am sorry for the speaker and I don't like him at all. <laughs> Yeah, well, I know you're feeling it's you, but 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 you
you quit. Would you get? Go ahead. Come on. Come on. I can wait my turn. Ladies and gentlemen, I want you to look at me because I do believe that I actually have the solution to global warming. No, it's not capitalism. And we actually had somebody present on it a while back. You know, we really are stuck in a quandary because we really want our high energy lifestyle. We really want our civilization to thrive. And the only way we're going to do that is to get some source of power that will power it. And I'm sorry to say this, but a lot of you guys think nuclear power might be awful. Well, I do agree. Nuclear power is awful. The, uh, the current light water reactors that we have with the high pressure reactor vessels, the containment and everything else along those lines are Bad. No, I'm not an expert, but you can check out the thorium alliance and check out it, check it out for yourself. There is another type of reactor out there, and the one of the reasons why we haven't really seen any innovation in the nuclear power industry to help solve our energy global warming problems is because we haven't been allowed to innovate in quite a while. We haven't let them take the time to use government money or whatever to research properly to get a good thing going. For me, I remember looking into this myself. When we look at nuclear power, pound for pound, ex expert for expert, we're still going to get a lot more energy out of a pound of uranium or a pound of thorium than will a pound of coal. The cost will be minimal if you look at the new technology called the liquid fluoride thorium reactor. It's a, it can fit in the back of a truck. It can burn up the present nuclear waste. Uh, yes, I do know what I'm talking about. Yes, I do. I looked it up, my friend. Yes, I have. That, that, and I'll be, I'll be willing to sit here and argue with you all night about it because it is a solution to it. To be very blunt. Not only is that just one methodology of solving the problems, but if you take a look around this, and I agree with Andy Anderson on this, there are always solutions out there. This just happens to be one of those things. It doesn't. To briefly summarize, the amount of the amount of thorium that would be about the size of my fist would contain the amount of energy needs for my entire lifetime. They said that about the other one. Yes, and it's probably true too, but the thing is there's a lot of flaws to the other type of nuclear power. I invite all of you to check out the Thorium Alliance webpage. Specifically look at John Kuntz and check it out for yourselves. I've been doing so and I'm getting to be more of a believer. I'm a skeptic by nature. I am getting to be more of a believer. Please check it out for yourself and look. It's uh, the, just Google the Thorium Alliance. Thorium Alliance. Oh, first of all, I do believe in free speech as a important constitutional attribute, but I do believe we have to be well informed in free speech. I, tonight's talk in person was one of the most ill informed I've ever come across in my adult life. But you know, in past history, we've had such things as. Uh, belief that the earth was the center of the universe, that was before Copernicus came along. We certainly had terrible controversy over Darwinian's theories, which I think have been more or less verified by experimental observation, and uh, but certainly a lot of controversy has ensued there. Uh, I think that some of our early, the issue of uh, alternative fuels, the uh, I think it took my view on the issue of nuclear power is to look at nuclear fusion, which powers the sun, and do more research to see if we can control that. But that's something for the future. And of course, the topic of uh, wind, solar, geothermal, and hydrogen are very important ones. And uh, that, I think, is a one way to really mitigate uh, climate change. Hydrogen has to be produced, of course, in a carbon neutral way. And there's a lot of outstanding research being done, which is not yet on the pilot plant level. Now, one of the uh, issues which is so difficult that it's hard to believe that anyone would propagate the notion that we're having global cooling 
if the uh, Arctic ice is melting uh, precipitously, and I won't comment about the Antarctic region because I'm not as familiar with that. Whether that, I suspect that uh, climate change is inducing collapsing of some of the ice sheets there as well. Now the uh, one important issue which came up is the notion of carbon uh, climate forcing mechanisms. And our speaker was did bring up points that are important about taking into account the astronomical factors, the distance from the star, the type of a star we have, its energy output, the inclination on our orbit, and there may be some changes in those things over astronomical time scales. But when we talk about climate change here, the climate Thanks, forcing Tim. methods I'm really sorry to do this over to the oh. human time scale, which is far shorter than that uh, of the astronomical processes that are really important. If you don't think they're important, look about the new 1,000-plus uh, uh, planets that are discovered and the proximity of some of the uh, uh, new planets to their parent stars and the temperature there. One good source here is Raymond Pierre Hubert's book, uh, Principles of Planetary Climate. And you can learn there specifically about how Venus eventually had an Earth-like atmosphere before the, our star heated up more and then uh, caused a lot of these light gases to evaporate and leached out a lot of the carbon dioxide out of the uh, subsurface regions of Venus. Now, Pierre Herbert's a geologist, too, so he's really someone I hope would speak before this group. And, of course, uh, Dr. Lovinger, whom I have uh, met in the last couple of years, and she once asked me to represent her in a meeting of the uh, environmental groups in Illinois because she was out of the country has uh, pointed out publicly that the uh, climate change is becoming the nation's leading public uh, health uh, problem. But her group, the Physicians for Concern uh, Social Responsibility, is a Nobel Prize winning group, and it's been my privilege of knowing Sarah. Now, uh, one of the most important studies that's come up recently has been uh, that of Jim Hansen, who you can look at his website, I met him a couple years ago when he spoke in Chicago at the No More Coal Symposium. And he has talked about the frequency of abnormal climate changes. And um, if you look at the earlier data that he tabulated for earlier epochs in, the, uh, in history, uh, they follow the normal distribution when you have a seven. That's the distribution used for grading on the curve. If you're one standard deviation from the mean, you're uh, getting you get a C. If you go uh, two standard deviations plus from the mean, you get a B. Two standard deviations away, you get a D. But the current data show that it follows a non-normal curve, symmetric about the mean, and you have a, a, a finite number of uh, abnormal climate events on both sides of the mean. One such event would be the snowstorm in uh, Indiana, I mean in Washington, D.C., which uh, Senator uh, this crazy senator from uh, James Inhofe from Oklahoma said uh, Al Gore was crazy because of that. Well, it's an abnormal event on both sides of the meat, and this is one of them. And uh, the, other, the other thing about uh, temperature and uh, CO2 is that the Keeling curve, uh, that's the person under whom Al Gore learned about climate, shows that this increase in CO2 that one of our speakers alluded to. And the change in mean temperature follows that very closely. So I regret to say, although I do think that we have an obligation to listen to people who want to speak, uh, it's, I, I felt very sorrowful for our speaker who displayed such ignorance that even a kindergarten student would not display. May his soul, may have mercy on his soul for the ignorance he displayed today. All right. All right. Oh, you want to go? Go ahead. Yes, please. My main point, points are that the speaker has overlooked and lost Don't over. Don't pull the microphone, it will come off. Grab the, grab the back. Grab the back. Okay. Anyway, the, the speaker has lost over a large number of points that I think need uh, more attention. Uh, first of all, as far as CO2 coming from the ocean. If it is coming from the ocean, it does periodically. It's not a problem. 
Most of the CO2 that goes into the ocean, the ocean is a primary sink for CO2. If it's coming out, there's a real problem because it means it's no longer being found as bicarb, not, therefore not being used by those plants that are integral to the oceans and that will not help us at all. Um, as far as the cooling cycle is concerned, there was a cooling cycle in the 1600s called the Mini Ice Age. That is disappearing. It's no longer cooling, it's been warming ever since. So, let's continue on with a few things that were not uh, uh, covered. First of all, there's been a melting of worldwide glaciers. The Swiss, who should know something about glaciers, are very worried about what's happening in the Alps. There has been, as has already been said by one person, a loss of Arctic sea ice. It is the smallest footprint that we have ever known. The Antarctic sea ice, as far as the Ross Shelf is concerned, I think most of it is gone, and it is now allowing the glaciers in Antarctica to move to the sea and therefore add to ocean level rise. Okay, then there was the report very recently, I think either in the early uh, 90, I think maybe or late 90s, early 2000, the Oceanic, and I can't remember the department report on CO2 concentration, maybe Frank can help me there, um, which showed a clear indication of increase in temperature as a consequence of CO2 uh, increase. Now, what the speaker did not say is that the most significant greenhouse gas is water. But water freezes out at a specific point in the atmosphere. And therefore, while at low levels, that is heights, it's significant. Overall, it is not. And it's quite variable. All right. Tracking global temperature increases in the U.S., I believe, dates from the early 1860s, and there has been a clear graph of slow but steady increase. Another component that was not covered is the height of storm thunderheads, which has been rising, causing a significant increase in uh, severity of storms all over, but tracked nicely within the United States. Uh, there has been a rise in global oceanic temperature. I believe the, the um, Atlantic has increased by two degrees. I'm not sure of the increase in the other oceans, but they have been increasing also. There's been an increase of cirrus clouds distribution within, within our atmosphere, the troposphere. That, of course, is a problem because they're still not sure whether that adds to global warming or detracts from it, but it is a change increase in the severity of average thunderstorms. That is all over, um, especially in, in regions below elevations of 1,000 meters. Here's another increase due to global warming. A reduction of the thermohaline flow, which is the main warm water flow to the north in the Atlantic Ocean, which keeps Europe warm. As that decreases, and it's decreased from 1950 on, it has been reduced by 50%. So is there cooling up there? Not yet. But you better watch out because it will turn a portion of Europe into a nice ice box. Okay. Um, as far as the Antarctic glaciers are concerned, I already mentioned those. They're disappearing. There has been a significant reduction in the Greenland glaciers. Um, let's see, uh, here we go. There has been a change in rain, rainfall in many parts of the world. Heavy flooding, severe droughts. I don't have to tell you that. Go back to the weather reports all over, especially the worldwide ones, and you'll see that that is correct. Here's an interesting point. Rise in winter ceiling in this country, meaning that the ceiling has risen, therefore,
There are thunderstorms in midwinter, in case you were paying any attention. This is due to global warming. You don't, you used to not have thunderstorms in winter, now we do. Is that just an, uh, an accident or an artifact? No, I don't believe so. Um, there have been a large increase in the number of tornadoes worldwide. Again, can you explain it? No. Uh, is this uh, just an accident? I don't think so. I think it's due to uh, global warming. There has been a forward migration of biovectors that used to be found in equatorial and just sub-equatorial areas, which is what somebody already mentioned. The diseases are moving northward. Why? Because of the change in temperature. Um, there's a massive methane release. What was not mentioned was this is due to the disassociation of methane ices. These are called clathrates, methane hydrates. This is occurring in the Tundra region, especially being monitored in Russia. It is also occurring in Canada. This releases huge amounts of methane, which have a greenhouse effect 25 times out of CO2. Okay. Um, the destructive effect of oceanic temperature rises can be monitored easily by looking at the damage that's being done to barrier reefs and other reef structures because it's affecting um, the, um, the, the, the reef structure. Okay. Um, the, I think probably, I should probably stop at this point, but there are lots of other things due to global warming. If you don't believe me, that's fine. I could be more than happy to present you with it. All of the data that I've been able to gather. Obviously, I don't have it with me right now. Give me a day, I'll send you stuff. Uh, otherwise, as I say, the evidence at this point is overwhelming. If you don't want to believe it, that's up to you. I can't force you to. If you are willing to look at the data, I think any reasonable person will see global warming is not a myth, it is not a hoax, and we better go and even pay attention to it. I was, I was very disappointed by this evening's presentation. The world is teeming with people who can't distinguish between the operation of their emotions and the operation of their intellect. And just listening to one more is mostly a waste of time. Uh, I would like to address the underlying of the side issue. Um, science is made of numbers, no, they watch it and as I, as I pointed out, there were no numbers in the presentation until the slogan of energy independence came up, and then it was the carbon industry numbers. Um, although I, I was entertained about the assertions of the sunspot cycle in the Middle Ages, since sunspots were discovered by Galileo in 1609, um, and, and explaining the medieval climate swings and of, of sunspots, I thought was kind of, of uh, creative. But let's see here. Oh, incidentally, clean, clean coal is another um, chimera. There's no such thing physically. There's no such thing. It's a little like perpetual motion. The United States gets 45% of its energy from coal, but 80% of our carbon dioxide emissions are from coal. And it was also a display of lack of research to claim that the oil blowout in the Gulf of Mexico, which was so catastrophic, will not be repeated because of regulation or something. In fact, the blowout in the Gulf of Mexico was a repeat. The same company had the same catastrophe in Central no Asia two years before, except it was a team of governments and it was easier to, to keep publicity from getting out of hand. But in fact, the, the, the BP catastrophe in the Gulf of Mexico was in 
almost identical to a, 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 a previous blowout by the same people. Uh, and as for numbers, uh, the United States consumes about 19 million barrels of oil a day and produces one half of that. Domestic production and domestic crude well, domestic production has peaked. Uh, the domestic crude oil reserves have been going for approximately 30 years. Um, there's uh, uh, some sort of overlapping expanded categories of crude oil reserves, technically recovering the reserves, recovering the reserves, certainly. But those grand totals completely omit the externalities. The shale oil coming out of Alberta is immensely expensive to extract, both financially and in consumption of resources and production of pollution. Uh, the idea of turning half of the Rocky Mountains into a toxic swamp, I, I, I think, does have serious downsides. Um, and I can look up a little more stuff. I've got my, uh, my phone at Google. Um, and it, it's it's I'll, distressing I'll that 10 minutes on my phone can come up with better data than the other people speech. <laughs> Is there global warming? Is there global warming? Yes. But is it a real problem? I see the global warming is nominal. And are we is the plant warming? Yes. But slightly. If we're talking two degrees in the Atlantic Ocean, that doesn't seem a lot to me. And uh let's see, yes. We have natural cycles, and things go on. I don't see where the big problem here is. Parts of the world are going to get warmer, maybe a little. But Alaska, Canada, Siberia, it will all balance out. Thank you. Well, uh, Bill, it's going to balance out, so you got nothing to worry about. Let's go on. All right, thank We all thank the singer speaker. I'm going to be eclectic as usual. I'm not going to get too much into the science. However, if you look upon the history of the United States, it's been the history of extraction. George Washington said there's one unique feature, several unique features about the new country, the new United States. He said one of those was geography. And he didn't mean the ocean. He meant the resources that we had as he traveled around. And it was correct in terms of lumber, water, uh, you name the mineral. We had it in abundance in a pure form, whether it was gold or iron ore, coal, later on, much later, of course, oil. Uh, this was truly a, a wealthy place, an untapped location. Um, the sad thing about this whole global thing is, jump on another one, is another topic is, I had some occasion to travel around the state of Oklahoma, from town to town. And it finally became studying the history of this, I discovered that many of the communities were in fact like a bust, um, like gold, gold mining industry. There was a, a spurt when oil, oil was found, and then they became almost like ghost towns, a few survived. And they're still intricately tied to the oil industry. So for some lefties to come along and say, well, we're going to shut down this industry, and we don't think this industry is a good idea. These people are very tenacious, and it permeates all the way through Texas. Believe you me, that industry is central to the entire economy. 
and you're not going to come in there and tell them that you're going to curtail this. They're not going to be receptive to it. These people just aren't there. Uh, next thing is historium. The guy was misleading here who spoke. They're doing research in historium. He gave us even a figure of 10 to 20 years before you may have a, an operational reactor. It's pie in the sky right now. It's so hypothetical that I'm sorry this thing. Well, go look at the website. I don't have to. It'll be 10 to 20 years. There are hundreds of researchers if you want. And it's, it's far from proven technology. And certainly not proven to the point you can't base current policy on such an extreme hypothetical. It's mythical. It's whimsical. It's foolish. Something that might happen 10 or 20 years from now is going to determine the policy that only might is going to determine the policy that you do today. This isn't even worth worthy of attention. Um, well, to say that there's an entire conspiracy, if somehow some environmental guys got in control of the scientific budget and amassed this word conspiracy, launched this conspiracy to which all the scientific community said, oh, there's money to be made here, we'll take bribes. Uh, you're into this conspiracy world, no thank you, this is like art bell gibberish, you know, Illuminati. I'm not going to even give that any credibility. Um, to say that there is, on the other side of the coin, disinformation, bad science being put out there by such people as Exxon, BP, uh, coal industry, that's, that's a given. Uh, to say that we have 200 years of this resource, again, is mythical and whimsical. We don't, the, I don't know, but yesterday I saw in the news that gasoline is going to $5 a gallon now in some locations. Rather amazing. I don't know why that's happening. If we have 200 years of oil, that it's going up in price. But if you cannot perceive that perhaps this is not the direction to go, uh, <laughs> In terms of policy, in terms of energy policy, I don't have to think about that too long. Um, we, we make choices. Um, choices in transportation, heating and cooling, and they've spoken on that. Um, I think we've got to make some choices in terms of living in sustainable communities. Let's get our feet on the ground. Stop this thing. I think the worst thing that happened to the conservatives, they used to ridicule the Greens and the environmentalists, but then the environmentalists were, were found to be correct. So your worst nightmare comes true. The people you're ridiculing are in fact accurate and correct, which makes you look like what? And the one thing we've got, to, and this will come up next week, Romney cracked the joke about the rising sea levels of the earth. Is this something to joke about? Now this is somebody who wants to get the highest office in the United States, and he's cracking jokes about sea level water rising. I don't know where this individual is coming from. He doesn't want to look at it seriously. This is, this is, this is something to really think about that he took, a, he took a thing as acceptance speech to crack a, a joke about global warming. Is this something to laugh about? I, I, don't, I don't understand this. This is this. But anyhow, if you think it's something to laugh about, you know, why don't you go over to the comedy club and we can tell a few jokes about global warming. Hello, I would like to thank our speaker tonight for giving us a graphic presentation of what I've been talking about for the last five years. Of I've done a dozen talks here on Censored News. This is Censored 2012, how the media maintains a segment of America in a state of uh, ignorance and denial on certain subjects that are common knowledge all over the world. Uh, 
our speaker tonight was unfamiliar with some things that are just common knowledge. But at any rate, I'll be trying to go through the list here. Clean coal is a total oxymoron. It's time we face the reality. Yeah. Our speaker was unfamiliar with Rocky Mountain Institute, which uh, Amory Lovins, uh, their recent book is called Reinventing Fire, kind of out the last couple of years. It talks about the third industrial revolution, moving humanity away from coal, oil, gas, and nukes into alternative, clean, green sources of all kinds. <clears throat> you know, throughout the speech tonight, I thought, what other kinds of topics would could you give a speech talking about uh, the history of the Vatican and claim you never heard of the Pope? <laughs> could you give a history of the Chicago Bulls for a half an hour and say, Michael who? Uh, how can a person uh, give a talk on a subject and be unfamiliar with basic reality that we're bathed in week by week by week? That's my question. I, we should show compassion for people that are coming along because Project Centered describes, you know, this is uh, the new one will be coming out in October. It gives you the top 25 blacked out stories of the year. And our speaker gave an excellent summary of the talking points put out by Exxon Mobil, which is the largest polluter on the planet. Um, those are the talking points. You know, we have three people from Exxon Mobil, 987 climate scientists on the other side that are in total agreement. But the money for the advertisements pours out of Exxon Mobil and uh, these other uh, oil giants. A few other points that might not have been covered. You know, the disaster in the Gulf of Mexico was one of biblical proportions, and the major media have not been covering how big the disaster actually is. They're losing billions and billions in fisheries and everything else. It's a, it's a disaster that's 10 and 20 times bigger than the Exxon Valdez in Alaska. Oh, hundreds of times, not ten or twenty. And the, the concept of 200 years worth of recoverable oil through drilling and fracking is a disaster of biblical proportions. Now, I'm beginning to come to the conclusion that fracking is being promoted to create a market for clean water because fracking destroys the groundwater and then you can pipe in water from freshwater sources and charge poor people whatever you want because they need water to live on in their livestock and everything else. Nobody is talking about that possibility. The promotion of nuclear power is also uh, one of, it's the pinnacle of economic insanity because nuclear power plants at today's cost are more expensive than solar panels at current prices, which are more expensive than cheaper wind and all kinds of other facilities. We're bathed in massive amounts of energy fall on uh, the planet. You talk about clean nuclear energy, we have a clean nuclear reactor that's 93 million miles away. And it sends energy, massive amounts of energy to the Earth every day in the form of light. The ratio you should remember, I talked about this four years ago, is 10,000 to 1. 10,000 times more light falls on the planet every day than what we use. We collect one ten thousandth of it, one hour. That's what Rocky Mountain Institute is talking about in this book, Reinventing Fire. One hour of solar intake will run the human race for a year. And that's just the solar. We're not talking about tidal, geothermal, wind power, wave power, all kinds of things. We are bathed in free energy that we are that has been held back in America because they can't figure out how to put a meter between our roof and the sun. Uh, you know, as soon as they figure out how to meter the sunlight, we'll have solar panels going up everywhere as fast as possible. The ocean is a CO2 sink. You know, that's what we don't realize is that you know uh, methane is 20 times more dangerous to the atmosphere as a global warming gas than carbon dioxide. But you know, carbon dioxide is uh, captured in the ocean and also it's a great sink, uh, what they call it, you know, captured in rainforests. Rainforests and trees everywhere take in carbon dioxide, right, and put out oxygen. Well, as you cut down the forests and the trees everywhere for farming and everything else, the total global concentration of CO2 goes up. 
So I, on one last thing I'll say, a lot of you may have been noticed I've been wearing a button that got them down from 50 months out, saying that we, we, we got three months left now. December, 30, December 21st is the end of the ancient Mayan calendar. The Mayans got the time frame right. How they did it, nobody knows, but they predicted massive change, both good and bad, leading up to the junction of the start of the new cycle in December. And we're absolutely seeing that with all these things happening around the world. The gentleman over here said, you know, that there's giant cyclic swings in temperature. It's way hotter than normal, way colder than normal. That's the absolute definition of climate change. So uh, I think we should, we should help our less informed citizens try to catch up as fast as they can with the knowledgeable people all over the world. The rest of the world doesn't live in a bubble of ignorance like what we have here in the United States, generated by the American media. Thank you. My name is Michael Foley. There's a guy who's been going all over the world, anyway, all over the United States and Europe and Asia. He's been doing this for maybe 10 years. I don't know exactly how long. The guy has said that, he's, he, he's a, he said this whole man-made global warming thing is a hoax. That's the burden of his song. Man-made global warming is a hoax. He has said that human beings can burn any amount of carbon they want whether it's petroleum, crude oil, coal, wood, humans can burn any kind of fuel they want like that, crude oil, carbon fuel, and it has no negative effect on the planet. That guy's name is Al Gore. Al Gore has been living for 10 years saying that every word out of his mouth is a lie. Al Gore is really the face of the whole man-made global warming movement, but he is a effing liar, L-I-A-R, all capital letters, and he is the one who says so. <coughs> he says you can burn any amount of carbon fuel you want, and somehow you just pay a guy off. Now that's what you expect out of politicians, because that's how they live, but that's how Al Gore says he didn't say who this guy is, you got to pay off, how this guy got to be in charge of taking the payoffs or whatever. But pay this guy off, and he'll give you a little slip of paper that says, here's a carbon credit. Ten tons of carbon, thousand tons of carbon, million tons of carbon. Whatever you want. Burn whatever you want. Do anything you want. Crap in your own dinner plate. It's okay, as long as you pay off. Al Gore is a liar. Yeah. Al? Who said that? I did. I am not a liar. Now substantiate what you just said. Gore, substantiate what you just said. Everything you said is... One sentence. Say one word that I said was a liar. Why didn't you read it? No, no. You say. Now you were demanding people answer your questions. I'm telling you. What did I say that was a lie? The words represent everything Al Gore has done. Al Gore is the one who said that. Those are not my words. Al Gore is the one who says he's a liar. That's complete fabrication of reality. One fool at a time, quiet. I can substantiate what I'm saying. Now, Al Gore has been flying all over the world in private jets, which is a very inefficient way to travel. Al Gore drives around in convoys of limousines and SUVs, which is also a very inefficient way to travel. Al Gore's got a house in Tennessee with a heated indoor swimming pool, which is inefficient. And Al Gore has an electric bill in his house that's supposedly $5,000 a month. And Al Gore says this is all okay. He just pays a guy off and the guy gives him a carbon credit. Al Gore talks a bunch of BS, and Al Gore looks like a Roman emperor. Al Gore does conserve one thing, that's food. There is no food wasted in the state of Tennessee because Al Gore eats it all. He tells us to conserve and he weighs about 400 pounds. 
or at least he did until somebody pointed it out. Then he started wearing baggy clothes. Now, we're not going to have to worry about global warming anyway. Because we're going to be long gone before that ever occurs. Even if it's natural or even if it's man-made. Oh, anyway, as far as you call me a liar, I said Al Gore is the one who said we can burn any amount of carbon fluid fuel that we want. And all you got to do is pay off the next time. I just what he said. That is what he said. I just want to... Then why is he doing it? Then just... why is he... He says it by his actions. He says it by his actions. Why are you screaming? I'll get to that in a minute, too. I substantiated what I said. I will not submit to your domination trip. I will not submit to your domination trip. I will not submit to your domination trip. There have been plenty of people who have screamed tonight, and you did not tell any of them to stop screaming. I will not submit to your domination trip. Now, as far as screaming, I am very glad that I was here tonight because I really didn't think that this topic would bring out the hostility and the emotion and the vitriol that it has. I really didn't think so. And I'm glad that I saw it. Anyway, I have said that Al Gore, by his actions, have said this man-made global warming thing is a hoax. Al Gore has, by his actions, said that he himself is a liar because all his talking about global warming is BS. Oh, one thing about what you said, sir. You said science is based on numbers. I won't argue that. But politics is based on bullshit. And that's what this whole global warming thing is on both sides. There's mountains and mountains of bullshit. And you don't seem to understand that. I'm not here to say, I told you, I'm not going to submit to your domination trip. I'm not going to submit. One fool at a time. Shut your mouth. It's my turn to talk. And I will not submit to your domination trip. We are living through the end of the world. The only problem with living through, living through the end of the world is because when the world ends, we're still going to be alive and we're going to have to find drinking water and food. The financial situation in this country is going downhill and it is not going to stop. There's going to be a president inaugurated in January and it doesn't matter if it's Barack Obama, Mitt Romney, or if it's Rahm Emanuel, as I have said before. The financial condition of this country will continue to deteriorate until we are all destitute. That's all. And I won't submit to your domination to sir. And I did substantiate what you said. And you did not substantiate what you said when you called me a liar. Well, that's not what I heard from Al Gore, and I listened to him for a week. You're a liar, too. <laughs> I, uh, many of you might know about the current campaign being ran by 7-Eleven, uh, called the 7 Election Campaign. Where you can actually go out and vote for your favorite candidate by buying a cup of coffee in the morning. And, you know, I have here the Obama Cup, and I have here the Romney Cup. And it's kind of interesting to see what happens to me when I get one of these cups in the morning. Or when I get one of these cups in the morning. No, trickle-down government versus trickle-down economics. I don't know if we have much choice left in the matter. Every time I get this guy on the mind, he talks about government programs, but I usually get, usually get delayed by road construction somewhere. Traffic's usually a lot worse, and I usually wind up getting late for work. This guy, on the other hand, I get through the stuff, but when I go to work, we get so buried that I'm usually late after leaving work for some other appointment. So I am still not sure yet if I'm even going to buy another one of these cups because they don't really represent to me what the views are. One guy causes me having trouble with road construction, government programs kind of running. He wants more of them. This guy wants to be booming in private industry. I get so much work on Barry. You know, it's it's kind of amazing. But the funny thing about it is, in the last three election cycles, this little 7-Eleven or 7-Election campaign has accurately predicted the winner. So far, Obama's leading. And so far, Romney's losing. Personally, I'd like to see them both combined together 
and really make some solutions for this country. Thank you very much. Since we're going twice, are you guys done? I, I don't want to, what is the phrase he used, dominate him? I, I, it was only about a month ago, I attended Al Gore's week-long series of lectures, and I, I didn't find anything that Mr. Foley said to be quite accurate. I, the gentleman started something called the Climate Reality Project, and is, though some people didn't like it, so they go after him. I don't think his views or lifestyle have anything to do with global warming. Any more so than I've heard this on speakers in the college, and I really don't care for it, when people ask questions regarding their biography. We're here to discuss issues and problems and solutions. And I don't really care who stands up here or where they come from or what they do, as long as their information is, is accurate and they're giving arguments and they're up, to, up here to, and they have to defend it. You know, but I don't really care about this biography. It doesn't interest me in, one, in any fashion whatsoever here. Because I think we're, the purpose is to filter through the facts and the information. And if you want further research, heck, does anybody can go to their local public library or if, uh, I hate to say this, this internet thing. <laughs> but honestly, no. Uh, I think some of the, the detract, again, we've seen so much assault on this issue from people who stand to lose. And they stand to lose money, and they're not going to give it up easily. So they'll attack anybody who's associated with them. And that's what we have to avoid altogether. And that's why, I'm sorry, Mr. Foley, you're entirely wrong. You're, you're doing exactly what the energy companies, you, what did you get your lessons from, Exxon, Exxon, to attack him? Performing an association, what does it have to do where he lives? I don't care where he lives or how much he eats or how he gets around. He why? He put it out. Al Gore himself. Put it out. Al Gore himself says every yeah. word out of his yeah. mouth is a lie. He don't live it. If he oh, thought there was have not been disproven If he thought lies. there was such a thing as serious no. global warming issue, he would be living differently. His points have not been discredited as not being factual. I'm sorry. No one. Find me a review. He himself has discredited himself. Get up there and rebut, Foley. Uh, if we have no other speakers, I asked the speaker about the position of the senator. He said that I could look at the uh, website. What I want to find out is had he checked this? Had he actually looked? Apparently not. It's hard to tell, but apparently not. I don't think all of our politicians are so lazy that we can't write them a letter or see them face to face or go to their office to find out what they're actually doing. Uh, I think there's something to be said for thoughtful conservatives. The problem is, I saw an article in the Tribune by, I think, Clarence Page. I'll try to bring that next week. Clarence's position is there are very few uh, thoughtful, reasonable conservatives. What they do is simply deny and say no until they are forced to find the truth. Uh, I'll try to bring that article next week. That sounds like a lot what happened here tonight. Uh, it was instructive to me. Thank you. I have done a lot of research on Mark Kirk's uh, 
views on uh, climate change. Uh, in the late 1990s, Mark Kirk was a uh, U.S. House counsel, and he did a lot of uh, legal work for Competitive Enterprise Institute, which was the leading opponent of uh, the Kyoto Treaty at that time. Uh, one of uh, Councillor Kirk's po positions at that time was that uh, if we did uh, have the Kyoto Global Warming Treaty passed, it would benefit Saddam Hussein. And uh, that is that I found on the internet because Mark Kirk did pro bono legal work for a Competitive Enterprise Institute. He helped organize a symposium in Kyoto in opposition to the uh, Clinton Gore administration getting the Kyoto Treaty through Congress. Uh, when Mark Kirk became uh, uh, U.S. Congressman from the Illinois 10th Congressional District, he muted his opposition to uh, the climate change issue because of the strong support for the environmental uh, programs in that district. But he was very much uh, in opposition to Kyoto, and he said that uh, you had to cut down the China and India from doing that. Uh, I, I heard it a few years ago the former Prime Minister of Canada uh, pointing out that if you want China and India to cut their per capita emissions, you have to do it in the United States because they have every right to come out of poverty. And so that was um, this wonderful uh, former Prime Minister. Her name, uh, I, I heard her speak at the uh, public, uh, Chicago Public Library. I can't think of her name right now, but I, I had a chance to talk to her on that issue. Now, uh, more, more recently, uh, I, I am very sorry to hear that Mark Kirk is, uh, had that stroke. I certainly pray for his recovery. But he did say recently also that uh, <coughs> there must be no global warming issue because, uh, you know, Al Gore had some uh, marital problems. So therefore, there really wasn't any climate change issue. So Mark Kirk came out of the closet. And uh, Mark Kirk fooled a lot of people, including the Sierra Club, of which I'm a member. And we were very opposed, many of us, to his endorsing. They endorsed him in one year, and it was a travesty because of his uh, deep-rooted opposition to uh, the climate, the fact that climate change is a reality. So that I don't know that much about Richard Durbin. I know that Durbin is very much in support of uh, Obama on this issue, and uh, I respect him for that. But. It's a very sorrowful thing that the way Mark Kirk has been able to fool, fool a lot of people for a couple of decades on this issue. Maybe not climate change, but climax change. I have one quick follow-up to what Charlie said. Uh, Charlie said uh, he, he, he likes to find solutions. Hey, Frank, if you're interested in solutions, we want it on, uh, it's on the, uh, the list on December 1st. I'm going to do a presentation on solutions to global warming. Uh, and I'll bring some models of, uh, you know, some new light bulbs, all kinds of things to save energy. Uh, it'll be like a show and tell, uh, solution based evening uh, based around uh, the reality of the research done by Rocky Mountain Institute over the last 30 years. So, uh, we'll, on December 1st, we'll have uh, a lively discussion on the solutions that are being currently being implemented in countries all over the world. We won't be talking about unsubstantiated opinions or maybe something could be done 20 years from now. We'll be talking about what's happening right now, what has been happening over the last few years with other countries trying to address what is increasingly uh, accepted to be a critical climate change problem. So, uh, for any of those of you who are interested, come December 31st. Uh, December 1st. Thanks. Bye. All right. Oh, we got Jesus. Jesus. What does Jesus think about global warming? It's a sin. It's a sin. All right. Uh, this has been one of those uh, meetings of the College of Complexes from uh, the uh, from the speakers uh, introduction of the topic uh, to the re the uh, interruption. Uh, from the audience uh, and uh, the interruptions of uh, various uh, 
three butters, uh, and uh, the uh, return to the microphone of uh, the previous three butters. Uh, I, I've uh, seen a better disciplined uh, college of complexes. Uh, more, more often uh, than, uh, than this, uh, and I hope in the future uh, that you will be better behaved. So I don't know how I can uh, assure you of this, but uh, uh, I will do my best. Well, good night, everybody. I've heard enough shit already. <laughs> Shame on you. I don't take those scoopers. Take me off. All right, now our speaker is getting his rebuttal. Okay, I, hey, uh, I, I tend to uh, listen to uh, people, people want to be critical. And I always consider the source. I tend to let it go after I consider the source. Well, I want to say a couple of things. Okay, I was asked about some resources. I just want to give some resources. You know, you want to take time and look up these websites. You know, and I think it would be very interesting to do so. Now, this one website is the uh, Institute for Energy Research. <clears throat> and that's the, that's the resource that I used to talk about. Repeat it, please. Institute for Energy Research. Institute for Energy Research. Research. That's the uh, that's the website that I use to to talk about the energy resources that are recoverable. And, and when you go to this website, it will tell you that we have two million barrels of crude reserves. We have four million barrels of technically recoverable crude oil. We have 800 million barrels of oil shale. We have 2,303 billion barrels of undiscovered resources. Take your time and look at the website. Make your judgment about what's, tell, what's being said at the website and come to your conclusions. Now, I also mentioned earlier that at the end of the website, you see that they talk about the Green River Formation in Wyoming, which has 1.4 trillion barrels of oil. And then you mentioned also about 86 billion barrels of oil in the outer continental shelf, 24 billion in the lower 48, 2 billion in the Alaska North Slope, 19 billion in Utah uh, tar sands, 12 billion in Anwar, and then uh, I mentioned about 800 billion in oil shale in Wyoming. So take, you know, just just take take a few moments and take a look at the website and make your judgment. Now the other thing too is that somebody else mentioned about some of my resources. One resource that I use is uh, uh, Dr. Frank Hill. He's associate director of the National Solar Observatory. And that's under the Solar Syntactic uh, Network. And what he what he's what he's doing in his in his article is talking about the fact that the solar cycle may be going into hibernation. But look at Dr. Frank Hill at the National Solar Observatory. And, 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 and make a judgment about what he's saying. The other, the, the Competitive Institute, Enterprise Institute was mentioned. Dr. Myron, he built that the Competitive Enterprise Institute have did another study that I think is worth looking at. These are some of the resources that I use to, to, you know, to, to inform my presentation. Now, I don't want to go into a whole lot of other stuff that was said here, because a lot of, you know, all, all this, all this criticism and all that stuff, you know, is, is okay. I mean, it's just it's a forum for criticism, it's just a forum for supporting positions. But I just want to leave everybody with, you know, with those resources. Take some time, look at them, and make a judgment. Um, the Institute for Energy Research's president was formerly director of public relations policy at Enron. Have you looked into the funding of your sources? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you read the source and you make the judgment. Yeah. Have you looked into the funding of your sources? I said, look at the resources and make the judgment. Is that a no? 
Let me ask you a question. 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 You make your, you make your judgment. You make your judgment. Whether it's scientific, scientifically valid. Well, it's corroborated. If you choose to reject it, that's your Hey, Charlie says nobody can be bribed into being a, a source. That's what Charlie said. Charlie said your argument is uh, invalid because nobody's paying off all these guys to be sources and take sides. That's what Charlie said. Nobody's paying off all these people. <laughs> so for you to question somebody's source of the funding, Charlie said you're going oh. to do something you need to do. Going down. All right. How come I'm the only guy that's going to fight down? People have been interrupted for two and a half hours. How come I'm the only guy that gets hold the wipe down? You're the only guy. Get out of the ball. You can yell at it. Nobody told me to shut up. I'll tell you, yell at me. Yell at me.